this morning. I hope you're here ready to go. We're going to take this time to do our meet and greet this morning. So if you hadn't had a chance to visit from this side to that side, go right ahead. Take this time to greet your neighbor this morning. Everlasting love, your mercy is as good as the rising of the sun. Lord, your loving kindness, your loving kindness is better than life. Grace is all sufficient, it's an all sufficient grace. Power and your glory are forever on display. services this morning, especially we'll welcome any uh, visitors we may have and just ask if you could to fill out the tab on the side of the bulletin and drop it in an offering plate when it comes around. If you're a first time guest of ours, we will welcome you with a special gift bag we've arranged and we just uh, ask that you raise your hand up really high at this time and one of these ladies will get that to you. And also after services, if you are a visitor, you might want to stop by our visitor center out here in the foyer, okay, to the left as you leave. Uh, as far as announcements today, uh, the golf tournament, which was held, was supposed to be held yesterday, has been postponed till July 20th. Uh, now will be tee off time at 8 o'clock a.m. It's postponed for obvious reasons. If you was, wasn't asleep, you knew it rained most of the day yesterday. So, uh, uh, also tonight, uh, at, in our evening services, uh, Mr. Ken Rich will speak to the ch church concerning an automated telephone communication system. We'd like to have everyone here for that. Also coming up this week, the Baptist Women and Young at Heart has meetings. Uh, Baptist Women will meet Monday the 3rd at 6.30 and Young at Heart Tuesday the 4th at 11 o'clock. Also, uh, there's a, I've had a couple people ask me about this children's day camp, June 3rd and 4th. We believe that's going to be at Bellevue Baptist at Melbourne. I would call them before you go. I believe it starts at 8 o'clock in the morning. So uh, try to give Bellevue a call. If it's not there, they'll be able to tell you where it's going to be. 
Uh, also, got a couple announcements here. Got Casey Moss and Jessica Jones. We'd like to invite everyone to their wedding on June 8th, 2013 at 4 o'clock p.m. here at the First Baptist Church. Reception will be at the Miller Hickabotham building at the fairgrounds. And that'll be from 6 o'clock to 10 o'clock. Got one more card I'd like to read. It says, to our church family, we appreciate all the prayers for John during his surgery and healing. It has been a long process, but he is on the mend. God is so good, and he's had a lot of help from all of his children. It says, because uh, I couldn't be more grateful for the thoughtful things you do. And that's in Christ's love, John and Claudia Stone. That's all I have today. Did you have any birthdays this past week? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. How about anniversaries? Happy anniversary. Father, we do thank you for this day you blessed us with, and we thank you for this rain we've received this past week, Father, and we just ask that you just continue to bless this service, that you bless Brother John as he brings the message from your word, and we just pray that you just go with us throughout our week, Father, as we leave here today, and we just ask that you just guide and lead and direct us always. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Welcome again this morning as we begin to worship today. I'm going to start with a song, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord. So sing with us this morning. song, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me.
prepare for our offering this morning. And as we prepare for that, uh, this song is very dear to a lot of people here in this church. It's just how great thou art. But it's uh, set to a different tune. And I hope we can worship with this morning as we sing how great our God is this morning.
your summer I sure hope so I know that uh, some of the teachers are they're glad to be out of school and I know a lot of young people are they're glad to be in ball playing ball and we're just glad you're here today and I'm glad it rained some of the games out so some people can be here that wouldn't normally be here uh, I know some are in the hay and uh, asking the Lord to protect them as they mow hay and take care of their farm life but I am so glad that we're able to be here worshiping the Lord today. Amen? Amen. Starting a new series in the Old Testament, and we're going to walk through about, I don't know, 30-some weeks probably of uh, big events in the Old Testament. I, I guess I'm going to call it watershed moments of the Old Testament because watershed moments are game changer. That's when everything changes, and today in Genesis chapter 3, we're going to talk about the first one of these that I want to speak about, these game-changing moments and uh, uh, these watershed moments. I don't know how many of you, I'm not going to take a poll, but uh, if you haven't read it, you ought to read it. How many uh, would say to themselves, I need to do this or I have done it, yes, that was an incredible uh, book to read. How many have read a uh, poem to read, really? How many have read uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost? If you haven't read it, I ask you to read it. It is, uh, it, it, it's incredible. It's uh, about the fall of mankind, and it really deals with Genesis chapter 3. And as Milton speaks about uh, Paradise Lost, uh, that's what happened in, in Eden. We lost paradise, and man's been tr attempting to regain paradise ever since that particular time. And Adam and Eve are, of course, the central characters in Genesis chapter 3. And when you come to Genesis chapter 3, you see Adam and Eve. You see that they blow it on a colossal scale, and the repercussions are still affecting us today. And, in fact, uh, there's a little poem, shortest poem in the world, 
uh, about Adam. And uh, it's simply entitled Troubles. Shortest poem in the world. Here it is. Troubles. Adam had them. That's it. That's it. And you know what? Every one of us since Adam have had them. I mean, we all have troubles. We, we experience trials and tribulations and difficulties. And uh, there's a reason for that. And today I'm going to uh, give you the reason for that and the method of escape. So I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to read Genesis chapter 3. Uh, you'll need to keep your Bibles open. It will be on the uh, screens. But it's always good to have the very Word of God in your hand and you're able to return to it or write on it or whatever you need to do. In Genesis chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said? Now you need to underscore that in your Bible. Has God indeed said? You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Father, I pray that each of us might understand what your will for our life is, that we might simply surrender our will to yours, and Father, you may be glorified through us as we live out the likeness of Christ. Help us today to understand uh, we need to avoid certain things in life, and help us, Lord, that we need to realize we need to run towards certain things in our life and help us, Lord, to understand we always need to look unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. In Christ's name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Have you ever had a dangerous conversation? You say, a dangerous conversation? Yes, a dangerous conversation. There are some conversations you don't need to be involved in. There are some things you need to stay away from. There are certain things that you just need to run away from, and you don't need to be involved in those things. Eve got in a lot of trouble because she had a dangerous conversation. She had a conversation she should have left alone. She should have not become involved at all. She had this conversation with the devil, and the devil came to her, and, and has God indeed said? And what we need to realize is we need to run. The only thing you have business talking to Satan about is simply saying, get behind me, Satan. That's the only thing you need to do. Thus says the Lord, get behind me, Satan. Don't get in a conversation. You're going to lose every single time. He's smarter than you are. And any time you get in one of these conversations, you're headed for trouble. So just simply avoid it. There are some things that are just simply best left unsaid you just need to walk away you don't need to be involved because when you become involved you're going to lose now as we think about this there are three things i want you to realize about a dangerous conversation and 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 take this litmus test with you and and don't allow yourself to fall into this trap that is set three things about a dangerous conversation that you need to understand and how you need to avoid this number one is the tempter the tempter. The tempter comes and he tempts us to get involved in this conversation. Who was the tempter here in Eden? Uh, the word is Nakash. And Nakash means a bright, beautiful, shining one. So this bright, beautiful, shining one comes to Eve. Beautiful, not frightening, beautiful, attractive, and attracted to, and comes to Eve, and he begins to say, Has God indeed said? And what you really need to do is partake of this particular fruit. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of a serpent, I think of a hideous creature that needs to die. If I see a snake, I don't care if it's a king snake, I don't care if it's a cobra, it needs to die. It needs to die. I am scared. Of those snakes, I think there's a reason to be frightened of those snakes. And those snakes, they just need to get away from me if they want to live. Because if they touch me, I'm probably going to die. So somebody has to lose their life, and I choose the snake to lose its life. But this beautiful, shining creature 
came to Eve. And we think of this hideous creature, but it was the most beautiful creature that she'd seen outside of the Lord himself. And this beautiful devil comes to Eve and engages her in a conversation and begins to tempt her. Now, we have a tendency to think of Satan in the context of a medieval devil. We see a red suit. We see a pointed tail. We see a pitchfork. And that's how we perceive Satan to be. But I want you to understand that. That was not what Satan looked like when it came to Eve because don't you think she would have run? But the Satan came to her, and he was beautiful, alluring, and the temptation was cast. He was not ugly but appealing and beautiful. You know what Satan does? Satan comes to us not looking ugly, but he comes offering us choices. Choices between right and wrong. Choices between life and death. Choices between good and evil. And here's the issue. We get to choose. And often we choose poorly, and then we engage in this conversation with the tempter, and we will lose. That was the tempter, Satan. Who was the target? The target was Eve. Now, Eve had not been created first, but second. And Eve is the topic uh, that we pick up here and the target that we see here. And Satan comes to Eve. Now, did you notice when he comes to her, not when she and Adam are together, but when she's alone? Now, what does that mean for us? That means this. There is safety in numbers. We should always hang out with other people that are going to help us not get isolated because every single one of us have weaknesses and every single one of us have the propensity to choose poorly. And when we choose poorly, we're going to experience a consequence that none of us won't, and that's what happened here. So the target was Eve when she was alone. Satan comes to her. And First Peter 5 Verse 8, it says, The Satan is a what? A roaring lion. So, what we need to do is be sober and be vigilant, and we need to be watching because we're going to be attacked. Now, when I think about this, I always think about uh, Animal Planet or Wild Kingdom back in my day, and you'd watch a lion cut out from the herd, an antelope or a wildebeest or, or some animal and and you know what the, the lion didn't just pounce on the entire herd but he cut out old limpy he'd see old limpy just kind of that's the one i'm going for the old the weak the young the one who could not protect himself and the lion would cut them from the herd i told you the story and i'm going to go back over it a few months back or maybe a year ago lose track of time cut from 500 to 100 to 50 to 10, finally gets down to one, and that one is the one the lion eyeballs, the one the lion pursues, the one the lion takes down, and the one the lion consumes. There's always a tempter. There is always a target. So what we need to do is not become an easy target. We need to stay connected. But the third thing is the tactic. The tactic in, in chapter 3, verse 1, it tells us what the tactic is. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, has God indeed said? Here's what it is. Satan always puts a question mark where God has put a period. God says, here it is. This is the way it is. And Satan always twists that around and said, now wait a minute. You need to think about that. I mean, let's be a little more intellectual. Let's, let's not be so blunt let's not make it so stark let's think about this let's debate this let's consider this and then once you do pandora's box is open and once pandora's box is open you can't get it closed again and then all of these questions and all of of these problems start coming and pretty soon we are overwhelmed and then we get into this dangerous dangerous conversation that only spirals downward and we're always going to lose what we need to do is remember this one passage of scripture that's so important and that is proverbs 3 5 and 6 listen when all else fails when everything else fails you can rely upon this trust in the lord trust in the lord trust in the lord with all of your heart 
Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Now, did you hear that? All your ways. Don't decide for yourself, but in all your ways, acknowledge him. And here's what he'll do. He will direct your paths. But what we have to do is say, Lord, I will submit my will to your will. Now, here's what I want you to understand. You may not understand all of the Word of God. You may not even be able to comprehend it. You may say, that doesn't even sound right. I mean, society and culture say that's wrong. I'm going to tell you something, and I will go down on record here, and I have in the past, and I will until the day I die. You can believe this always, and everything else will change, but this is the unchanging Word of God, and you can believe it's true. Now, if you don't, and you say, well, culture says issue of homosexual marriage. Culture says, I'm going to tell you, I love homosexuals. Uh, I, I love them, but I'm telling you, it's wrong. I'm going to tell you, it's wrong. I'm going to tell you, sex outside of marriage, it is wrong. I love you, but it is wrong. I'm going to tell you, listen, drug abuse, alcoholism is wrong. Those are always wrong. What we need to do is say, God, I will trust your word, I will adhere to your word, and I will follow your word. And when we do that, we won't fail. We may be maligned, and we may be accused, and we may be castigated, but I'm going to tell you something, you will be right with God. Don't get in a dangerous conversation, you'll lose. Second thing I want you to understand about, about this passage of Scripture is not only the dangerous conversation, but look at verse 6 and 7, this destructive choice. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he did what? He ate also. And in verse 7, the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Now let me just simply say this. They made themselves coverings out of fig leaves. Do you know how big a fig leaf is? Huh? Do you know how big? I mean, it's not this big oak leaf, and it's not a, a fig leaf isn't this, uh, this huge uh, elephant's ear. Fig leaf's tiny. How many fig leaves would it take to cover yourself? Well, depending on the size you are, I guess. Some of us are larger. Some are smaller. Some are younger. But I'm going to tell you, even if you did cover yourself, here's the problem. They're not going to last. Fig leaves wither, turn brown, crumble. And then what? You need more fig leaves. So you have a real problem. So this destructive choice, this really was the loss of innocence. I mean, until this time, Adam and Eve were in a perfect environment with a perfect God, and they had not made one single bad choice. But it was the loss of innocence, the loss of purity, and because of this one choice, this one tree that was planted in the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they ate of that tree, and now because they did, in my DNA and in your DNA, there is a sin nature. We get to choose. You know what comes with choice? Bad choices. What comes with bad choices? Bad consequences. Amen? Have you ever made a bad choice? <laughs> Have you ever said, I wish I hadn't have done that? Or even better than that, I wish I hadn't have said that. I mean, it's so easy to speak before you think. And once it comes out, you can't reach out there and grab it back. I mean, it's out there. And by the way, I don't, didn't intend to say this, but I'm going to go ahead and say this. Uh, listen to me, people. Everybody listen. Up. Now, I know I'm, I don't do Facebook. Sandy has a Facebook page with my name on it. I don't write on it. I don't do any of those things. I don't, every now and then she'll say, look at this picture. But I, I want you to know something. When you say something on Facebook, everybody sees it. And when they see it, you might remove it, but it's already there. Would you please be a little smarter? Seriously, would you please not say some of the things you say? Now, be sure that your words are sweet because you may have to eat them. Be cautious what you say. It will come back to haunt you. By the way, my son works for this company, and it's a, a Fortune 500 company. He said, Dad, they go back 
now and check your Facebook and everything you've said to find out if you're a loose cannon or not before they'll even consider hiring you. Be careful what you say. It could haunt you forever. Enough of that. Didn't mean to go there. But there's a destructive choice. And the step number one, it's a thought. It's a thought. It's right in here. We think it, and, and we can't always control our thoughts. I mean, you have thoughts come and go constantly. I mean, they're just coming and coming and coming and then going. But Eve saw, Eve took, Eve ate, and then Eve gave to her husband Adam. Those are the usual steps down this silical pattern. We fall into sin when temptation comes. There's nothing wrong with temptation. Temptation is always going to come. You can't stop temptation from coming. Temptation will always come. That's not a problem. Temptation is there. When the thought grabs us, however, and then the thought is in our heart and our mind, we begin to play with the thought. We begin to analyze the thought. We begin to to take that thought that passed through our minds and begin to give it some room to grow. And it gets bigger and bigger, and then it begins to consume us, and we begin to fantasize about that thought. Listen, what you need to do is deal with it at the very beginning. Lord, take that temptation out of my mind. I love what Billy Graham said in one of his books. I don't remember which one it was in. may have said it in more than one. But he said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. And that's so true. Listen. You need to come to that place where you say, God, I'm not going to let that come and get get behind me, Satan. Lord, help me. And when you don't know what else to do, go to Scripture and read Scripture, pray. You say, well, when I pray, these thoughts come to my mind. Well, read the Scripture. Read the Scripture. Read the Scripture over and over and say, God, help me through this. Help me with this because this thought is consuming me. But that's the first step down. The second step is the temptation becomes an act. We begin to act on what we have fantasized about, thought about, mulled over, and ruminated, and now it becomes real. And we begin then, as Eve did, reached out, and she took the fruit. She touched the fruit. And, and God said, don't eat. Don't eat. She touched it. That's the second step down. She still hadn't sinned. God didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat it. But she touched it, and then she was going to consume it. Now, the problem with it here is when you have taken that second step and you're closer to the temptation and closer to the sin, here's what happens. You're getting closer and closer to the edge, and pretty soon, without even knowing it, you're right on the edge, and the next step is a step down. Here's what you need to understand. Don't take that step. Don't get close to the edge. Stay as far away as possible. Here's what Satan says to you, though. I mean, you get right over the edge, and you're right there at the edge, and here's what Satan says. Hey, you've come this far. You're past the point of return. You might as well go ahead and do it now. And you know what we say? Wow, Satan, you're smart. You're right. I'm going to go ahead. You know what we need to say? Get behind me, Satan. I'm not going to take that next step. I've not gone past the point of no return. I am going to return back to God. Get behind me, Satan. But the third step, the sin step, is where the sin comes. And this is where the problems come. Eve took it. She conversed with Satan. She took it, and then she ate it. It's probably not an apple. We don't know what it is, but it was forbidden. We do know that. And she consumed that food. And you know what the problem was? Then it became part of her. That was the problem. It became part of her. It was in her DNA. It was in her nature. And the two became one. And then the fourth step down, the fourth sin step is this. The, the sinner then becomes a seducer. Have you ever blown it? Have you ever blown it? I remember being in high school, and God say, listen, uh, <clears throat> John, you need to go with this man. We, 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 uh, man, I tell you, this, this, this uh, uh, what were you? Oh, Mad Dog 2020 is so good. Mad Dog 2020, you might know what that is. Come on. That was a cheap wine. I don't guess I ever had any Mad Dog 2020, but I always heard about Mad Dog 2020. Oh, this Mad Dog 2020 is so good. Really? Or this Everclear. I guess that's 190 proof or something, and it's just like uh, pure grain alcohol and to make your eyes water and your throat uh, constrict and your stomach. It's just horrible stuff. I remember taking a sip of that one time, and I thought, there's nothing good about this. I can't breathe. 
but, but here's the thing. I mean, once someone steps over the line and they participate, do you know what they want you to do? Participate also. Oh, you're going to enjoy this. This is going to be fun. So the one that's seduced then becomes a seducer. You just need to come with me and enjoy this lifestyle. And that's what Eve did. She partook. Her eyes were open. She runs to Adam and says, Adam, you have got to try this. And you know what old Adam says? Oh, baby, we weren't supposed to do that. I should have told you that. My fault. No, Adam says, give it here. And Adam does the same thing. And listen, when we do that, we have gone too far. Now, that takes us to the third step, and the third step is the divine confrontation. We find in Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 and following. Watch what happens here. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God. Hey, by the way, You've been in your bedroom as a young child, and you've been reading something, seeing something, saying something, and you knew you shouldn't have, and all of a sudden the doorknob starts to turn. It's mom and dad. What do you do? You hide the magazine. You turn the TV off. Well, now it's iPods or uh, phones or anything else. And they're like, what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing. Wasn't doing nothing. Right. Right, you weren't doing anything. We know you were doing something. Well, here's what happened. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, they did what every person that's ever caught does. Hid themselves. Hid themselves. Ran and hid. What do you do as a kid when you're in trouble and mom and dad come and, and mom said, wait till your daddy gets home. My wife never did that. She just took care of business. But sometimes they say, wait till your daddy gets home. When dad came home, where were you at? Just waiting in the front door saying, I'm guilty, hit me. Whip me, whip me, spank me, spank me, spank me hard. I deserve every bit of it. No, you're hiding. You're hiding. You're trying to act good. I didn't do anything. Well, here was Adam and Eve. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. And the Lord God said or called to Adam and said, Where are you? Adam, where are you at? Now, you know that God didn't say that because he didn't know he knew exactly he said i heard your voice in the garden and i was afraid because i was naked and i hid myself and verse 11 said who told you you were naked have you eaten from the tree of which i commanded you that you should not eat the man said the the woman whom you gave me to be with me did you notice who she blamed the woman you gave to be with me She gave me of the tree and ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. Well, that's where the old proverbial passing the buck comes. I mean, hey, I wouldn't have done it, but they told me. I mean, they they, they led this, and eventually it gets back to God. God, it's your fault. I mean, it's the woman that you gave me. But this divine confrontation takes place. You know what? God simply wanted them to admit their sin. Have you ever noticed how much we shift blame? I mean, when we're in the eye of the storm or the focus is upon us, we always want to say, I did it because, or it really wasn't my fault, it was. We always want to shift the blame. The woman finally shifts the blame. Eve, what have you done? It's the snake's fault. Poor old snake didn't have a leg to stand on. I mean, what was he going to do? And he just look around like, hey. But that's what happens. We want to shift the blame, shift the blame, shift the blame, so we divert it and we don't take as much credit for what we have done that's been wrong. It's a beautiful picture, however, that God looks at them and says, listen, you can't even clothe yourselves. You need me to clothe you. You need me. These, those leaves aren't going to work. I'm going to do something to help you. Let me ask you a question. Let's get very real right now. Adam and Eve were hiding behind leaves and trees. Listen, what are you hiding behind? What are you hiding behind? Self-righteousness? I'm as good as all those people down at First Baptist. In fact, I'm as good as all those people in every church in In fact is, I'm as good as every person in every church in the state of Arkansas. In fact is, I'm as good as every person in the entire nation, entire world. I, we're, there's no difference between me and them. We're all good. I can do it however I want to. I don't have to go to church. I don't need any of that. Self-righteousness. You begin to evaluate yourself against somebody else, and you always evaluate yourself against somebody that's a failure. You notice that? You don't ever say, well, 
according to this person who really loves the Lord and, and does all these incredible things, boy, I, don't me- I better measure myself up against Brother John because he's a scoundrel. I know, I'm going to measure myself up against that, and John will be down here, I'll be up here. So I'm going to measure myself against John, or I'm going to measure myself against, against Bill, or, or whomever it may be. And, and you begin to do that, and you always put the person down here and put yourself up here, and you say, at least I'm as good as they are. Self-righteousness. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're as bad as everybody, and I'm as bad as everybody, and all of us have fallen short, and it doesn't matter what you're trying to clothe yourself with. If it's not the righteousness of Christ, you're out of luck. You need to realize you've blown it. Well, maybe it's not self-righteousness. Maybe it's riches. Maybe, maybe you have a pretty good income, and you say, well, you know what? Uh, I give a lot, and I help a lot, and I share a lot, so I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of good deeds. I'm doing a lot of good things. I, uh, you know, and we start boasting about what we do to help others. Well, I gave so-and-so this, and I gave so-and-so that, and I helped here, and I helped there. So? So? That's good, but it's not what we're talking about. Or maybe you hide behind the tree of religion. I'm religious. I'm religious. I believe in God. Do you know what the demons believe and they tremble? There's nothing that will work there. You know what God says to every single one of us? Whatever you're hiding behind, come out, come out wherever you are. You need to come clean. And then what he does, he gives us a detailed condemnation of what this whole episode costs. God spells out the punishment. God spells out and warns us uh, of the consequences of this. He has given us the choices, and we have failed. There are boundaries, there are lines, and we have to stay within those boundaries and within those lines. He spells it out, starting in verse 14. So the Lord God said, because you've done this, you've, cre- you've, you've committed this sin, this perfect environment, you're cursed more than all the cattle. This talking to the serpent. And every beast of the field, on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. You shall, and your seed, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. And the woman said to him, I, and, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception and pain. You shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He r- shall rule over you. Adam said, because you have heeded the voice of, my, of your wife, have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake and toil. You shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it's going to bring forth. And you shall eat the herb of the field and the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. From out of it you were taken and from dust you are and dust you shall return. Satan, you're going to become a snake and you're going to crawl around on the ground. That is, that, that, that's That's your curse. And every time I see a snake, it's an object lesson. It's a reminder to me of the curse of God. And I see that snake, and I say, Lord, you are so true and so real, slithering around on its belly. And uh, I think of the passage of Scripture that, that it says here, this is the first gospel, if you will, in chapter 3, verse 15. And we have in uh, the, the New Testament, we have in Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son born, of the, under, the, born of the, under the law and born of a woman. And I want you to know something about that. When God sent His Son, God had said, you're going to bruise His heel, but He's going to crush your head. Talking about Satan, the serpent, and the Son, God, the Son. And then it says in Romans 16, 20, the God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet. Shortly, the grace of our Lord Jesus shall be with you. Amen. Here's what happened. Satan is going to be cursed, and Satan will be cast into a fiery pit forever and ever and ever. That's the curse. Woman, ladies, uh, childbirth. You're going to have pain bringing forth a child. Any woman that's ever had childbirth experienced that knows it is painful. That's a curse. And then there's going to be a battle between men and women for control of the home. And God says, uh, uh, there's, you're, you're equal, but uh, your husband is to, is to have the leadership position, and he should lead in the, in the likeness of Christ. And I know no lady likes to hear that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And, and God says that we should lead in love. And I've always said, you know, when the two become one, 
You don't need a general and an army of one. So what you should understand is you make these decisions based upon mutual love, respect, and admiration. And and then once you make those decisions, the man says, here's what we're going to do, and you go forward, and that should be the way it works. But because of that, there's going to be problems between men and women, and we see that even today. For men, here's your, here's your curse. You're going to have to work hard. And in the sweat of your brow, you're going to make a living. If you're a farmer, it's thorns and thistles and bushes and briars. I mean, it's not going to be easy. And you, it's going to take a lot of difficulty to support your family. Here's a conclusion. Verses 20 and 21. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living and also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God, here it is, made tunics of skins and clothed them. I want you to understand this. That's a beautiful picture of the blood atonement. God says you can't clothe yourself. You can't forgive yourself. You can't save yourself. You can't cover yourself. I will cover you. Now, I can't say this is uh, absolute, but I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to find out what that first animal that lost its life was. And I'm going to tell you, based upon Scripture and throughout Scripture, I'm going to tell you what I think it was, a sheep, a lamb, because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now listen, here's what happens with all this. You have been tempted and you have failed. You have sinned and you have fallen short. You have struggled you have strained, you've tried, you've attempted to do it yourself, it can't be done. So here's what God does. He says, I've got it, guys. I'll take it. I'll take all of your sin, all of your problems, all of your failures upon myself, and I'll forgive you, and not only will I forgive you, but I'll save you. I'll save you eternally. You don't have those fig leaves that are going to fail and fade away. You're going to have the covering of the very blood of Christ, which, which will last throughout all eternity. Which do you want? Your self-effort or God's? God's perfect act of forgiveness. Let's pray. Then I'm going to ask you to simply come if you need to give your life to Christ. You need to join this assembly. You need to be faithfully involved. Whatever you need to do, I'm going to ask you to come. Father in heaven, I do pray for your will to be done. I thank you that your grace is sufficient. I thank you, Lord, that you give us a true picture of temptation and, Lord, you give us a true picture of what sin is. It is failing, falling short. And, Father, I thank you that by the grace of God, you have made a way. And by the blood atonement, we can have peace with God. Lord, may your will be done this morning in Jesus' name.